Hey guys, welcome back. It is your favorite Gimple the Limp, and I am here with a special treat for you. And those of you who are perceptive can go ahead and figure out that this is some sort of DVG game. Uh, obviously, tell them by this, you know, it's some type of air game, and you might be confused because you're like, okay, I recognize some of those compor uh, components and think that we are getting ready to crack out Corsair Leader, which is obviously one of my favorites uh, when it comes to the Leader series. I gotta say, they really, really did good with the, the Corsair Leader game. It had a few little hiccups there at the beginning, but uh, thankfully they did work things out. It's all flowing smooth now, and thankfully it's like taking the Browns to the Super Bowl after taco night. Everything's just flowing as smooth as it should be. Uh, this is not going to be that, though. This is going to be about Zero Liter, which is coming to Kickstarter here very soon. Now, everything I'm getting ready to show you guys is not specifically Zero Liter. I do have some of the components, of course, Zero Liter set up because what I have is the, the files for the test kit for uh, Zero Liter, and I have printed out a few little homemade counters a few cards, uh, pieces like that, things that I can incorporate over. I'm going to show you all these pieces here in just a minute. And what we're going to do is we're going to do this in a couple of different phases. For those of you who may not have played Corsair Leader or DVG's Leader series, we're going to just go over the basics of how one of these games is played. All right. We're going to use some of the zero components, go over the basics of the game, play just a little bit, let you guys see how this operates. And then we're gonna switch over digitally to where I've got the rest of the files because it would just take me a week to, to print all that out and turn it all onto to actual game components. There is a lot uh, there to go over, but I'm gonna show you guys kind of where it's at. So obviously everything I'm showing you guys now is very, very, very prototype. It's very early stage, but it'll give you an idea of where things are at. And if you guys are like me and you liked Corsair Leader, this is just going to be more of that good stuff, more of that stuff that you liked. Uh, DVG, I have found, is very good about doing that. They they develop a system and then they keep going with that system. They keep tweaking it. They keep refining it. They keep expanding upon it. A lot of the, the systems can be interchanged like Warfighter. Uh, all damn near everything in Warfighter can be used with each other. So whatever you have of one can be used with another if you want to. If you guys saw my uh, my zombie modern series that I did on Warfighter, this isn't going to be quite as intricate as that, you know, as interwoven as that. But DVG games uh, do go along with that and the ease of play because they always have it all spelled out there on the board for you. Uh, but let's get into it and start showing you guys a little bit. Like I said, we're going to do just the basics of how this type of leader game is played and then show you some of the components. All right, so one of the first things you're gonna do is you're gonna pick one of these like uh, scenario sheets, campaign sheets, uh, just depending on what you're playing. And it's gonna give you a lot of detailed information. Here we see this is the Port Mosby Lay. I think that's how you pronounce that. You guys will obviously tell me if I'm wrong. But uh, it shows you your uh, your basic area of operations, your time frame, what aircraft you have available. And we see now we have things like the Zero, the Oscar, the Betty, the Nell. These are the aircraft we're going to be used when these used to be our bandits. And our bandits are going to be things like the P-39 and the 40, of which I do have a few of those printed out here for us. Uh, to throw onto the board. So obviously just a reversal of what we saw in Corsair. And the way this is gonna work, you see how it has a whole bunch of different numbers spread across this map. And then it says stress, depending on how far out it is. And that has to do with these target cards. And we'll get into the target card more specifically here in a minute. But you see how it has a number here at the upper right. And again, these are prototype components and stuff I printed out. So keep in mind, all prototype, all I'm going to keep saying it, nothing finalized. But this says number one, and that number would be associated somewhere on this map. Now, I don't think this specific target is actually on this map. I just printed it off as a good 
uh, test card, example card for us to use for our, uh, our game here. It'll have historical text, obviously, you see here, historical text, historical, <laughs> historical text. I got a, uh, a kick out of that, and then uh, the special rules underneath that, special rules, special rules, special rules. And you guys forgive me, my printer is crap, so that's why you see all this uh, spacing on here, the, the lines, I, I've gotta get a new printer at some point. Uh, but you're going to pick how long your campaign is going to be. So four days, six days, or nine days for a uh, short, medium, or long. And that's going to tell you how many points you get. And you use those points to buy things like pilots and aircraft and equipment, uh, all that different stuff. And then down here at the bottom, recon and intel. This is stuff that you will gain as you play through the campaign. There's a couple of counters that you use to keep track of that. And this will help you as your game goes on. As you can see, like with Intel as an example, the more Intel you get, it will reduce the numbers of bad guys that will actually be at some of these sites later on. Now, to reiterate it again, we're not going through every single rule of Corsair Leader. This is a quick overview. So don't use this to try to learn how to play the game. This is just the basics of the game, okay? And then again, it shows you what your victory points are for each one of the campaigns and how well you did. Now, something else is maintenance uh, tokens, maintenance crews, stuff like this uh, that are involved. And we are going to cover those here in just a little bit. But that's something new that is involved with the zero leader with the Japanese because the Japanese did not have as much equipment as the Americans did. So they couldn't just change out a plane they had to be able to keep those planes going, which meant they didn't have quite as many to throw at mission after mission after mission. And that is simulated here in this game. Now we've got another sheet as well that I've got printed out here. And here is the dogfight original mounted board from uh, Corsair Leader. And if you see by looking at these, I mean, they're almost virtually identical. And it took me a sec, I'm like, What's different? I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm not seeing it. And then there actually are a few things that are different. And that comes into play, I'm trying to get the light off of you guys. Uh, down here, when we're going into uh, enemy maneuvers and friendly maneuvers and things like that. And I will go over that here very soon, but it has to do with some new stats that we're going to see on our pilot cards. Things like the robustness of the plane or its maneuverability, stuff like that actually comes into play. You see here, friendly maneuver success is now D10 plus MN, which is your maneuverability plus friendly air to air minus enemy air to air. That MN stat was not in there previously. So that is something that is different uh, here in zero leader. This is what I'm talking about. They take small little adjustments here and there and they're constantly tweaking. What can we change? What can we improve? What can we do to make it that much more realistic, that much better uh, for our players? Now, if I grab a couple of cards here, this is real card from Corsair Leader. And this is a card from Zero Leader. I actually think I did fairly decent printing these off. It's hard to get the, the sizing just right when I'm having to transfer the files around between all this different crap. All right, so if you're looking at these, you see for the most part, they're, they're relatively uh, similar. You've got the name of the aircraft, uh, SO points on the left. Some of that stuff isn't on these just yet, still being tweaked. Uh, year, name, skill level uh, up here at the top. And we've noticed there's some new stuff up here. The MN, that's its maneuverability. That R factor is its robustness factor. And both of those come into play when we get into combat. We'll show a little bit of that as we move these guys in here in just a little bit. Uh, see, uh, blah, blah, blah. see on our cards here, the C stands for cool factor. Now the ones that I printed out are fairly decent uh, pilots. They're skilled. So these numbers are gonna be a little bit higher for our example game here. Uh, cool factor that helps reduce stress, keep the pilot in action longer. SA is situational awareness. It's one of those little tokens you can use uh, for bonus effects in the game. But here we come across another difference. If I zoom in a little bit, you can see this says GH, that stands for gung ho. Here we've got SS, that's samurai skill or samurai, samurai spirit, excuse me. Samurai Spirit, and that is a little difference, but not a whole lot of difference. Let me grab one of these gung-ho markers. 
previously we had gung ho markers, and those would be associated with um, the Corsair fighters. And now we are going to have, forgive my crappy uh, counters that I printed out, Samurai Spirit. You notice they look very similar, and they provide a very similar effect. Actually, let me pull up. I made myself some notes here so I can make sure I keep track of everything. Your Samurai Spirit uh, can get you a lot of special things. You can expend a counter to do treat and unfit or shaken pilot as being okay for the mission. So if your pilot wasn't good to go, he could be treated as good to go by spending our uh, counter there. If you suffer a hit, so a shaken or damage or destroyed result, you can spend that to get rid of it. Uh, you can spend that to the treat, basically treat as a no effect. Instead of rolling for an attack, you can treat the attack roll as a 10 and then apply modifiers. So let's say we were doing something like dropping a bomb and we wanted to, to get that perfect hit so we get a whole lot in there. Or doing something that is new, also new in the game, kamikaze attacks. Because if you do a kamikaze attack, you can hit with your plane and all the ordnance that you're carrying and it all counts as like max hits so you can end up getting something like eight or nine or ten hits in a single go it can cause some real max damage and then using a samurai counter with it oh man just good stuff with that uh but we'll, we'll, we'll touch again on that here in just a little bit so you can use that for a perfect attack uh you can also uh actually just checking my notes here now recovering your samurai spirit actually has to do with your target cards. And I'll show you some of those later in the video, but some of these cards will have uh, SS or Samurai Spirit, depending on how they decide to annotate it on the card. And with that, you can recover these counters onto your pilots. And it's not just the pilots that ran the mission. It's also the pilots that didn't run the mission. Or now there are cases where you have some target cards where it's either gain these or gain another pilot with that skill. And then there are some targets where you get to do both. You get to recover counters and gain an extra pilot that has the uh, the Samurai Spirit skill. So that is something else uh, that is new, that's interesting into the game. I really like how uh, they're doing that. All right, now continuing on around our cards here, we're past the uh, Samurai Spirit. You notice on the far right of that, we've got W and W. Both of those are on both cards. That has to do with weight. That's carrying ordnance to do stuff, to, to drop bombs and things like that, how much you can carry. But to the left of this one, you know, uh, notice that it has AG, and that has to do with something called aggressiveness. And that will be another factor that can come into play when you're conducting an attack with your, uh, with your zeros, with your fighters. So you can factor in basically that, uh, that aggressive Japanese spirit of we're going to, to fight to the end and die if need be and, ah, blah, 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 and and take you out. So that's what that number is going to be representing. Also something new. So the gung-ho samurai spirit, they're both relatively the same, called different things between the games, uh, similar effects, but we do have aggressive maneuverability and robustness factors that are all new on these cards versus our old cards. Again, don't take any of this as gospel. It is just the prototype, things can change. And for those of you who do not know what these numbers down below mean, we'll go over it very quickly. This has to do with the amount of stress that the pilot has received. If he's okay status, uh, he has the top line. If he is not, if he's suffered too much stress, he's gonna be considered shaking. And we'll have the bottom line and also lets you know what your speed is. So if you're fast, you attack before enemy bandits and sites. If you're slow, you attack after them. That's actually something else you can use. I think, uh, no, I think it's situational awareness that you can use that for, uh, actually, instead of Samurai Spirit. You can use situational awareness to attack in both time frames. So not either or, but say this guy being slow, he could spend a situational awareness to attack in fast and in slow. So that's really good. The numbers to the right here. ATA, air to air, ATG, air to ground. That has to do with bonuses they receive. You see the zeros, not exactly great attacking air to ground. Air to air, it is pretty good. And when he is 
good and not stressed. He's getting that plus two. So really good chance of doing damage. Plus, remember that air to air will come into effect when he's trying to maneuver in on his opponent. Uh, down here at the bottom has to do with what type of ordnance they can carry and then guns, what their skill is with their guns. So with this, you'd be rolling an eight or better uh, to cause a hit with your guns. And you can use your guns to attack air or ground targets. Let's show you the other one that I have got printed out. This is a bomber. This is the Nell that I also printed out to show you guys. You see it has a wider selection of bombs that it can carry. It's got the, uh, the kamikaze ability as well. You see actually air to air pretty decent. The bombers have been fleshed out a little more in zero liter versus Corsair. And the fact that the bombers can do some more air to air stuff like uh, attempting to suppress enemy fighters from other bombers. So effectively like your bombers are flying in a wing and they have tail gunners or, or things like that. They can try to shoot the, uh, the enemy bandits to suppress them, keep them from attacking friendly bombers but they've also accounted for the fact that there are uh, enemy bombers in this game as well. So you've got things like the B-24, the B-25 that have rear facing machine guns. So when your fighters come in, they can take fire from those and that's been accounted for in the game as well. So really cool stuff. Now for our purposes of our game here, I have just done these two cards, but I've got four counters printed out. One bomber, one fighter, one fighter, one bomber here coming in from a couple of different uh, directions. Like I said, we're gonna just kind of walk through how you would handle a mission. We're not gonna play through the whole, whole mission itself. We're just gonna kind of walk through it. Okay, now the good thing is that, like I said, DVG has this pre-flight and uh, sequence of play and all this other crap, lovely written down right here on the board. They do that with damn near every game that they have. It makes it very easy to play. When we go through this stuff, like draw target cards, that has to do with drawing a set number of target cards and that's gonna determine uh, what your target is for that day. Remember when you're doing your mission, your, your campaign here, grab our sheet back out, four days. So you're gonna be doing like four rounds if you do a short mission of drawing target cards and determining what your target's gonna be. And you can have secondary targets that you have to go after as well all that uh, interesting set of stuff. So we're gonna assume that we have drawn this one. Again, just, a, just an example of what can be. These are shore batteries. The number here in the center, that three, that's how many tar uh, hits have to be made onto the target to destroy it. Uh, that four, if I remember correctly, is how many aircraft can fly on the mission. Right here in the center, this has to do with what type of enemy resistance. So the higher these numbers, trying to make sure I'm tilting, not showing any reflection on this, uh, the higher those numbers, the worse it's gonna be, the more encounters you're gonna have. And I'm gonna show you guys here soon some more of the, uh, the target cards that are available, but they've got some really cool missions lined up. Things where uh, it's kind of simulating the fact that you're attacking out into the ocean, and you're attacking aircraft carriers or battleships or destroyers and uh, they've got sites that are naval really 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 cool stuff so this on the target you would draw one site and one bandit so that would be in the center area right here you would draw a couple of those counters so let's just draw a bandit we're not doing this in perfect order but you know giving you guys examples and to show you guys Get zoomed in there. This is one of the P40s. Those numbers there at the top have to do with its chance to damage you. So your its chance to cause from left to right stress or minor damage or destroy, things like that are what these numbers here at the top represent. Any bonuses, what year, its skill level with it being a green guy, and then obviously the aircraft itself. So we'll throw that down there. And I am cheating and using some of the Corsair um, sites just to kind of round out the, uh, the roster a little bit because they're relatively similar. Obviously, there are going to be differences, but they're, they're in the same ballpark. So let's grab one. We got some riflemen. And then on the approach, you would grab a site for each area, okay? Sites are the ground things, so 
you would have one here, one here, one here, one here. Now, some of these are going to say things like no, like you see how it's no banded or no sight. So if you draw some that are like that, it means you don't have anything to worry about. We're going to throw just a couple. And here we go. Here's one you see, it says no sight. So when you drew those out, if you were to encounter those, you would just pull those off and you wouldn't have to worry about it. We're gonna throw that down, that's good for now. And let's grab one of the P39s that I've got in here as well. All right, we'll throw him there and we'll throw this one over here and we'll pull that back off and put this in the center. So this is what your mission could look like. Again, just a, a, an example of what it could look like when you were to start. The area is kind of littered with different enemies, different aircraft that are impeding your progress and your mission is to get in and destroy that center target, which like I said, can be a multitude of different things from even stuff like a wing of bombers. I really like that, I think that's so cool. They, uh, I saw some target cards that were like B-24s or 25s, like three of them, and they're gonna stay in the center because so it's kind of like your fighters are coming in and, and swooping around them and trying to fight off their escorts so you can get in and destroy those bombers before they come take out your stuff. And obviously you can do this in a campaign game. Uh, remember how Corsair Leader has a um, aircraft carrier type campaign so you can play like you're on a, um, aircraft carrier and you're carrying on and doing your missions day after day after day. Really, really just excellent long-term replayability when it comes to this. I'm really looking forward to seeing how they uh, flesh out uh, Zero Leader and how this comes out. Because like I said, Corsair is really one of my top favorites when it comes to uh, DVG games. Going down the list again, you see we've selected our target, we've determined and we placed our sights. Assigning uh, pilots, we don't have any pilot cards just yet or anything, but we're going to go with we've got four aircraft and arming our aircraft. I'm arming them the same. So we're gonna have all of these treated like they're the same. So two bombers are both this guy and the two fighters are both this guy. Just the same in trouble of uh, having to print off a whole bunch of stuff. So our bombers, you can see they have a weight of two. So I went with a 100 pound bomb or excuse me, 500 pound bomb. You see in the top left, that's got a one. So it's a weight of one. Uh, 500 pound bomb has to be dropped at low altitude. And then the numbers there at the top have to do with what you need to roll to cause hits. So a single hit or two hits. And then of course your air to ground stat would come into play. And then that zero on there has to do with the range. There are some weapons you can fire at like range one. So you wouldn't have to be right in there. You could move forward or fire it at a range and Obviously, the cool aspect here, torpedoes. I really like seeing those. I'll show you guys those counters here in a little bit, but you could equip uh, bombers or your, your dived uh, bomber planes with torpedoes and have them do that low flying in and poof, drop torpedoes, try to take out the guys. And for our Zero, the escort fighters, we put drop tanks on these guys because they've only got a weight of one, and those drop tanks can be used to reduce the stress of the mission by one, really cool. So they don't have to, it's kind of simulating the fact that they've got extra fuel for the mission. So he didn't get to put on any bombs to help out. All he's got is his guns, but they've got extra fuel, so they're not as stressed out about that. And I know you guys are seeing some extra tokens up here. We're gonna to touch on those here in a minute. All right, now here I want to touch on kamikazes. So what you're going to do when it comes to kamikazes is you're going to select a kamikaze aircraft prior to a mission so let's say we selected this one, one of these guys as our, our kamikaze pilot. And any pilot chosen for a kamikaze mission would have all the stress removed pre-mission because obviously they're not coming back. <laughs> they are not stressed out. They take their little shot of sake, which sake's in this game as well. Tell me how awesome this. Um, they take their little shot, uh, shot of sake and they go out and blow themselves up. Uh, any pilot flying a kamikaze mission that becomes unfit during the mission attacks at a shaken stat of minus one. These are a lot of little uh, basic rules. Again, these are subject to change, but I'm going to read them out to you guys real quick so you understand the basics of what kamikaze is. Uh, needed and or kamikaze aircraft ignore maintenance needed and minor damage counters. Damage aircraft attack at minus one. 
add plus one additional weight point to any aircraft selected for kamikaze. So we could put an extra weight of bombs on this guy. And remember, this plane isn't coming back. You lose the plane and the pilot, obviously. But if you've got a target you have to take out, kamikaze that thing, you can guarantee it because you're going to get max hits on the thing. Uh, kamikaze aircraft cannot attack enemy bandits and bombers but may return fire at attacking aircraft if possible. Any air-to-air -air positives are lost for kamikaze aircraft in air-to-air -air battles. Negatives are kept in effect. Let's keep going here. Uh, any air-to-ground modifiers are in effect. Any aggressiveness stats are kept. You can see our bomber here does not have an aggressiveness stat. You cannot use Samurai Spirit on the target hit roll. Gain plus, oh, you can't use it on target hit roll. Oh, I missed that part earlier. But uh, gain plus two air to ground modifier for every turn spent in the center area before attacking. So let's say our little bomber here was the Kamikaze and he had flown in and was staying here and he just kept circling around. We spent some extra turns. For every turn he's staying here in the center area, that's an extra plus two that he's gaining on his roll to, to cause maximum damage. So that really comes into effect. That is sweet. Now also, kamikazes must dive from a high altitude uh, to attack. So you can see the counters. If we look in the bottom right, you see where it says H, that means they're high. And then when you flip the counters over, they're gonna have an L. I just cut out the uh, the H to signify which side was low. So say this is our low side. During your maneuvers, you can adjust from you know high to low, and you would get to here, be at high altitude, and then you'd switch him to low to signify the fact that he's coming in for his uh, kamikaze drop. And that gives him plus one attack. The pilot and the airplane are removed from the campaign after the attack, obviously and you can use either air to air or air to ground modifier for a kamikaze attack, whichever is better. So ignoring all that for a sec, let's go over the uh, the basics of the game itself. The game's gonna be played with some events being played uh, as you're going, once you get there, and then as you're leaving. Since that's so similar, we're not gonna worry about the events, but do understand that's gonna uh, take part in the game. Most are bad. There are some good events that can happen for you. I will be showing you the, some of those cards here soon. Now, when you get to this part, when you're over the target area, that's when you're doing this. And five times has to do with five turns that you get there. Uh, it lists down all the things like what happens in what order, dive bombers, dive to low, then fast pilots attack, then your sights and bandits attack. Uh, one pilot may suppress, pilots under attack may use evasion, that has to do with taking stress and trying to avoid getting hit by attacks. And then like I said, slow pilots attack after that. So it's fast, enemy, slow, then your aircraft move, then bandits move, then you advance the turn counter. So you're gonna do this five times, supposedly that can be adjusted depending on your mission, some missions will take an increase or decrease the amount of turns that you have. Generally, it'll be a decrease. Uh, but let's say we had come in and had gotten stuck in and we're moving in uh, to conduct this attack. Now, normally in these leader games, your positions of your counters don't make a huge difference. But when it comes to Corsair leader and obviously zero leader, your aircraft positions do matter because the direction, so let's say these two aircraft are engaged with each other. This is considered neutral. And then you have advantage. So for me, this would be advantaged because I'm facing his side. And then if I had him like this, this is where I would be considered to be tailing him. So this is the best position uh, to be in, all right? And then obviously the reverse is true for him, if he gets me around where he's on my six or having an advantage position against me. Now this is where this neat little chart comes into play and that aggression and maneuverability stat that we had talked about previously. This is where you can choose to do maneuvers 
depending on your role, your air to air stat could come into play and you would use that to try to gain positions, gain uh, attack bonuses against the enemy for your attack against them or try to get out of them attacking you. And you can see if you're neutral, it's no bonus. If you're advantaged, you get a base bonus. And if you're tailing, you get a plus three bonus against them. Thankfully, they've got a nice little uh, chart down here that tells us what we're doing, enemy maneuver choice, what they're gonna do. So it's a D10 plus the enemy's air to air. And that has to do with this little chart here. Bandit maneuvers, D10. Tailing, advantaged, neutral, disadvantaged, and being tailed. All right, so if they're tailing us, more than likely they're going to be doing these things, right? So it tells you when you're rolling, they do that. And then if they're in this position, they're gonna attempt to do this. And then you roll and you use your formula for all of that. All right, so like I said, I'm not covering every single little aspect, but I wanted to point out some of that uh, newer stuff. And one of those things is the aggression set, okay? So let's say these guys are doing their thing. Now, aggression has to do with when you move or the attempt to, uh, blah, blah, the enemy is attempting his maneuver, you may use your aggression rating to allow you to receive an extra die for the result. So when the bandit's moving around, say you don't want him to get around on you, you can use the aggression stat right here, but there is some potential uh, drawbacks to that. If you have an aggression rating, if you have a no aggression rating, you can't use it. So this guy could not use it. See, it's a dash, he can't. Sano here, or zero, he obviously can't. If you have a zero plus, you rating you would pay one stress to gain one extra die if you have an ag rating of plus one or plus two you can pay one stress to gain one extra die roll and add those to each die roll and you can choose the higher or lower of the rolled dice so obviously if it's helping you out you're going to choose the higher and if it's helping the enemy out you're going to choose the lower of the dice Basically, it gives you extra options so you have a better chance of getting the roll that you want, but that extra stress really can add up, so you don't want to use it any more than need be. And you can use it in offense during your maneuver success roll, your attack success roll, and then during defense, you can use it during the bandit maneuver success roll, and... Uh, we're not going to go over that list because we'll show you guys that here in just a little bit. All right. So to finish it out, you're going to continue in and boom, you're going to take out things like this. And then these sites are going to fire up. And as you can see, this site can fire at up to range one. It hits enemies high and low, big gun. And depending on what it rolls like with this one, that's that's pretty hardcore uh, site since it can hit on a two plus and can cause a lot of damage. Like it can destroy one of your aircraft. So you would want to suppress something like this. You could, uh, them being high, they wouldn't be able to suppress it with guns. So the bomber could suppress it with dropping an ordinance on it, but it would have to hit with the ordinance. You lose the ordinance and it doesn't destroy the site, right? So that's one of those things you have to consider when you're using your ordinance. You really don't want to let this thing hit you because it can cause some serious damage to you. But you're gonna keep moving in with your aircraft. You're gonna keep conducting attacks. You might have one that stays off to the side and still engaging with the bandit so your bombers can move in and you're going to try to attack your target site. You see here, we've gotta cause three hits to it and we would drop our bombs. So let's say we were dropping a stack of these bombs and we'll just, we'll do a roll just to say we did a roll. Let's say we were dropping two of those 500 pound bombs on it. Bam. Actually, that's pretty good. We got one 10 and one eight on that. And you guys can see on this, that would actually be enough to destroy it. Cause the first hit of a seven, eight or nine does one damage and 10 plus does two damage. So between those two uh, hits, we would boom, 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 do enough. We would take that out and gain the victory points. See the victory points here is two. And then we also gain bonuses to our recon and our intel. 
This is also a spot where you'll see, I think it's here, it might be at the bottom, but I think it's here where it tells you if you're getting uh, Samurai Spirit points back or not. I could be wrong on that one, but I do believe it is there. Obviously, after you've finished conducting your mission here, you will do a uh, event card on your way back home. Now, the rest of the stuff after this has to do with uh, rolling for any rescues that need to happen, but you're recording things like victory points, adjusting your recon and your intel, uh, gaining any SO points if you do them, uh, adjusting for stress and all this other stuff. The Corsair leader didn't have things when it came to maintenance, but Zero leader does. So let's take a look at that real quick. Okay, so the way this is going to work is after a set of aircraft have run their mission and they've gotten back to base, you've already tallied your points and your stress and all that good stuff. Now you are going to place maintenance needed counters on them and that's going to be placed on each aircraft that ran. And that's going to stay there until your maintenance crews take those off. And the way your maintenance crews are gonna work is that each main maintenance crew that you have, so let's say for us that we had um, two maintenance crews for our campaign, right? But for this mission, I didn't have enough cards out. But remember, we had four aircraft that went on this mission. So two of these, two of these. We'll place these maintenance tokens up here to signify the fact that we've got a couple extra planes up there. Now, each maintenance crew can maintain repair aircraft uh, for the next day's mission. Okay, so if we only had two maintenance crew, two of our aircraft would be maintained for the next day, but we'd still have two that still had the maintenance needed token. Now they can run the mission with a maintenance token on them, but you really don't want to. Also, uh, every campaign is gonna specify how many maintenance crews you start with. You can purchase extra maintenance crews. Right now, it's looking like that's gonna be two, four, or six SO points prior to the beginning of the campaign. And that would be for a short, medium, or long campaign. So the longer the campaign, the more the, uh, the maintenance crews obviously going to cost. Maintenance crews are not expended so you don't lose them, you have whatever amount of maintenance crews that you bought. Now, they can do this. They can repair, oh, excuse me, actually they would all be good. I was looking at the wrong thing on the chart. They can repair two maintenance needed counters. So actually our two maintenance needed, or our two maintenance crews would be able to repair all four of our aircraft. So one crew can take care of up to two of these counters, the maintenance needed counters. They, one crew can repair one minor damage or one crew can repair a damaged counter every two days. So remember you go from like stressed to shaken to um, minor damage to damaged to destroyed. All right, so these are the different things that can happen to your, your pilots in your aircraft. Now, with the, the minor damage, one maintenance crew can take out one of those counters. But with the damage, so a much more damaged aircraft, it takes one maintenance crew two days to uh, repair one of those. So it would take two days to get the aircraft back, but you can use two maintenance crews to repair one damage counter in a single day. So you can double up to repair things faster but that might mean that you might have to send some other aircraft out with maintenance needed still on them uh, since your other aircraft are being repaired by all of the crews. Something else you can do with your maintenance crews though is you can do what's called pushing the maintenance crew and you're making them work harder than they're supposed to. And this kind of printed a little funny on my little chart here. You're gonna roll a D10 for each one of those and nine plus, they're gonna perform an extra shift of work. For five to eight, they perform an after, uh, extra shift of work and they become fatigued. And if you just roll a one, they become, oh no, excuse me, uh, da, 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 da. I'm missing this. Nine plus, they just flat repair it like they're good. Um, five to eight, they perform an extra shift and then it's two to four, 
they perform an extra shift of work and then become fatigued. And one, they become fatigued and they make a mistake and add a maintenance needed counter on one of the aircraft that they worked on. So you can actually end up adding extra of these maintenance counters to them. So that can be a, <laughs> a real bad thing. You can push them. If you need them, you're getting close to the end of your campaign and you need these aircraft back. Too many of them are, are falling apart. You can try to push the crew, but that one bad roll, that can really uh, take it out of you. Unfortunately though, a fatigued maintenance crew uh, does not work the next day. So if you push them extra this day, you're not going to have them on the follow on day. So that's something that you gotta keep track of. Uh, you also do get a bonus if you're carrier based of plus one. Now the uh, the thing is when you're worrying about the, the maintenance of your aircraft here, the maintenance needed, you can send these, like I said, back out on another mission but that also incurs a D10 roll involved with it. So if you send them out maintenance needed or minor damage, things like that, it can affect the roll. And that roll can have anything happen from no effect all the way to the plane being destroyed. So like I said, this is really going to affect it because now you're not just worrying about your crew, your, your pilot being in a good mental state to run the mission because sometimes you have to decide, do I run the pilot shaken because he's already stressed and when he takes too much stress, he's just gonna be you know, down and out. I'm not gonna be able to use him. Do I, do I push him like that? And now you've gotta worry, do I push my aircraft like that as well because they have maintenance needs. The Japanese did not have the, uh, the amount of aircraft, the amount of crews, the amount of extra equipment that the Americans did in World War II. So I think this is a neat way that they're going about accounting for that and the fact that you have to adjust and keep your aircraft repaired in between each one of your missions. All right, and since I'm wanting to have this all be one damn video, um, I'm gonna have to stop talking here because there's, there's so much this game and I'm trying to tell you guys everything I possibly can and I know there's a lot. Let me go ahead and switch over to the uh, digital aspect real quick and we will just quickly go over the new stuff that is available for uh, Zero Leader and some of the new cards, the new counters, all that stuff that you're gonna see. Okay, so since this video has gone on for a long time, longer than uh, I was trying to shoot it for, we're gonna try to keep it at about an hour for the, the total, uh, totality of the video. We're gonna show you just a few of the components real quick to the game. You guys can see here, I've got the counters pulled up. Stuff like the 250 pound, 500, 1000 pound bombs, all these bombs, this is stuff that uh, was in Corsair Leader. I think most of the numbers are the same as well. Drop tanks, this is stuff that you guys have already seen, although I do love these torpedoes. Obviously they're naval, have to be dropped at low, range of zero, but they can do up to four hits worth of damage in one hit. So these are gonna come uh, into play really well in some of those naval uh, target missions. I'm really looking forward to trying those out. Uh, here are some of the bandit counters you can expect to see in the game. Again, keep in mind, uh, this is all prototype stuff. Nothing that you're seeing is absolutely finalized. This is just the base of where things are at. So things can change. Uh, I do like the fact though that the bandits have different skill levels. You see these guys are green. They don't uh, get any real bonus to their attacks, but there's some down here that are legendary that get some severe bonuses to their attacks. Cool part though, is when you have like veteran or legendary bandits, when you take them out, you can get extra experience points, extra bonuses, and those pilots get removed from the game. So if you were to kill these guys, they would be gone. Like so you, you were to remove them from your campaign and you wouldn't have to fight them again because you've, you've killed them, but they have slews of, of green guys that you can fight over and over again. Uh, scrolling down to another sheet of counters. Here's some of the sights that you guys can see. Uh, pretty basic stuff, heavy machine guns, light machine guns, 40 millimeter anti-air weapons. Again, you can see down here on the right of the counter where it shows high and low on uh, whether it can hit enemies at high altitude or low altitude. Most of them are low. All sites are gonna be considered soft though. So if you have uh, ordnance that gives a bonus to that soft target, you're gonna get that bonus when it comes to these uh, sites. Here's the P-39s that we just saw in our quick little overview. 
Ooh, and a 90 millimeter anti-air weapon. This thing is crucial. Goes after those high level targets, can hit them at the range one, and is very likely to cause some serious damage. This is a site you would definitely want to suppress and or take out as quick as possible. Uh, here's some more guys, uh, more bandits. You can see they have different levels between newbie here on the top left, green, ace, I think is that it's ace or average. I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, veteran down over here, and then even a legendary F4F. Uh, obviously, there are going to be some that say no bandit, so you're never going to know for sure if you're drawing a counter if it does have a bandit or not. So there are some missions where you could have a lot of guys, some where you uh, get lucky and not as many sights or bandits pop up. Again, buttload of riflemen here. Uh, more light machine guns, more 40 mil. I really would want to show you guys some of the extra counters for the naval missions. Those look really awesome. Here are the counters that you're going to use for your own aircraft. It's going to have uh, the name. I think some of these are placeholders as they have extra pilots added to the game. Don't quote me on that. They might be uh, uh, Kickstarter uh, counters as well. They may do the thing where they have uh, the ability to have a, a counter with your own name on it. They've done that in some games. I'm not sure if they're doing that in this one or not. So keep your eyes peeled in case you are interested in this one. Uh, let's see all the different aircraft that you're going to have available. Of course, the Bettys, the Nels, the, the, the Kai 43. I can't remember what that one's called. The Zeros, obviously getting involved and these are really 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 cool too the okas i hope i'm pronouncing that right i think this is like the jet powered uh kamikaze bomb that they had come up with late in the war this thing just looks awesome i'm looking forward to trying this out it comes screaming in and blows up a carrier or, or something like that uh other side of the counter remember the counters is going to uh your player counters are going to have low on one side and high on the other side to signify their altitude so the rest of those and then we have some more bandits this gets into the bomber bandits which is really awesome i'm looking forward to trying these guys out because like i said there are going to be extra rules like you can see the uh attack numbers here in parentheses signifying the fact that these can attack backwards uh, same with these b25s remember there are going to be some missions i'll show you those cards here in just a sec uh, where your mission is to take out the bombers to stop them from doing a raid on on your base or your carriers so there's b25s and i'm not sure what's going on with these smaller ones over here they might just be placeholders for the moment as they're being worked on or it might just rendered wrong but we've got b26s b29s b17s so a lot of different bombers that are going to be involved and some more no sites and here we get into some more of the uh, administrative type counters. Saki is going to be used uh, to basically help reduce the stress on your pilot. So you can spend SO points to get Saki and after a mission, uh, give them some Saki and knock off a stress point or two. Samurai points, uh, Samurai spirit counters, we talked about those. These are the damage counters, similar to how they had them in uh, Corsair Leader. So one side's going to be like minor damage, the other side's going to be damaged, and then obviously after that your uh, aircraft will be destroyed. Maintenance needed, we talked about those guys. These are counters to signify your maintenance crews. So however many of these you have is how many maintenance crews you're going to have to service your aircraft. Really like that aspect of the game. It's really accurate when it comes to the historical way that the Japanese had to fight because they obviously did not have as uh, many planes as the Americans did. This is the backside of those counters we were just looking at. You see Saki times two, Samurai Spirit, Spirit used, heavier damaged counters for those, maintenance needed times two, because remember that can go up, and then it just says maintenance crew on the back. Uh, these counters are really awesome. These are the naval counters. So when you get involved in some of the naval missions and you're drawing for your sights, obviously you're not gonna have riflemen or uh, trucks or stuff like that out in the middle of the ocean, you're gonna have cruisers and destroyers that have 
these anti-aircraft weapons. So that's what you're going to be drawing for. That is just freaking amazing. We got the 40 millimeter Bofors hitting high and low and hitting pretty hard. I got to say, starting at a two, that's, that's pretty hardcore, especially with these three inches hitting up to range one. And they can hit not quite as good as the 40 mil, but they can do it up to range one. Uh, heavy machine guns, those are the lighter ones. And again, you'll notice all these have the S for soft targets. Uh, we've got some 20 mils down here. And then the big boys that you're going to find on the destroyers of uh, five inch cannons. They only hit high though, but they can hit up to range one. So these will really uh, wreak havoc on your bombers as your bombers are trying to fly in and uh, drop ordnance on uh, battleships or, or uh, cruisers or aircraft carriers, whatever you're trying to take out, whatever your target card uh, specifies. So, oh man, this is going to be awesome. And then this is the, the backside of those counters. You see there are a few uh, no sights. So let's continue on. This is just the sheet that I showed you guys earlier that I printed out. Same for Port Mosby. Again, there will be a whole bunch of these with the game itself. We're going to scroll through the cards very quickly. Remember, when it comes to Zero Leader, just like in Corsair Leader, you'll have a named pilot. So we have Takanabana here but you'll have multiple cards, should be three cards with the card being double-sided. So the other side of this would be newbie. So you'd have newbie on one side, green on the other, average on one side, skilled on the other, and legendary and veteran. That's right, veteran's gonna be on the other side of this. So as your pilot starts off, he might start as green at the beginning of your campaign. And by the end, he is a legendary Kai 84 pilot. And he has a lot more situational awareness and spirit, uh, samurai spirit points to use. And he's more aggressive, all that cool stuff. But you'll notice the basics, the stuff that's attached to the airplane, like its maneuverability rating and its robustness rating, that's going to stay the same going across the board. And let's just scroll real quick. I'm going to scroll kind of quick through the cards so we don't take up too much time. But feel free to pause and eyeball any of the cards that you would like to to see some of the pilots that are going to be in the game or potentially be in the game. I got to make sure I put that out as a disclaimer because all of this is a prototype at the moment. A lot of zero pilots, but you should expect that since the name of the game is zero. Anyway, uh, Kai 43, I always like these, uh, especially in the game Warfighter. I always like flying the, the Kai 43. I always thought it was a good aircraft. Very maneuverable, not very robust though. And then the Betty bomber that uh, we did not use in our little test, but also able to do kamikaze stuff. Uh, scroll down through a little bit more. See a lot of pilots already in the game. <coughs> uh, and here's the Nell that we were showing off. A lot of those pilots as well. All right, and here's where I really want to show you guys some stuff. The cards, the target cards. I don't have any of the event cards yet, so I can't show you guys those. Uh, this is the target cards that you can potentially shuffle up and, and draw up during your missions. The shore battery one that I had just shown you guys uh, in our little playthrough earlier in this video. And you see a whole bunch more are going to be involved. Hostile forces, invasion forces, all stuff associated with the Pacific and the types of uh, conflict they had going on. The naval island hopping campaign except this is obviously going to be from the other side of it so this is going to be i think more of a defensive type campaign that you're going to be fighting trying to hold on to the ground that uh, you had gained early in the war because now the americans are pushing back out and taking those areas from you <coughs> uh, let's see command center ammo dump fuel depot and like I said, you guys can pause and eyeball some of these cards if you'd like to see them. These are the ones that I'm really looking forward to, stuff like this. Carrier defense, a uh, couple of different types of carrier defense, defending your airfields. So there's going to be offensive and defensive naval missions. Those are some of the main ones. I got to admit that I'm looking forward to, to trying out here. May, uh, minor and major airfields, machine gun nests that you're trying to take out, AA batteries, another arms cache, uh, truck parts. Oh, and these look like they're going to be fun too. Dog fights. So you'll have small, medium, and large dog fights where your goal is to destroy so many aircraft depending on 
uh, which dogfight it is that you draw. So you'll send in your zeros to attack their P-40s or P-39s or whatever it is uh, aircraft that you run into. Obviously, you see here on the bottom right here, this is where the uh, Samurai Spear is going to be located. So if you see this uh, icon, that's going to be signifying that you're getting back some Samurai Spirit or getting a Samurai Spirit, uh, Spirit enabled pilot. Uh, taking out some torpedo bombers, dive bombers, Ooh, the B-26 bomber mission that I had mentioned to you guys. And this one, you're going to be trying to take out the bombers and that's going to be the target. So the bombers are effectively in the middle of the, the target. They're going to stay there and your aircraft are going to fly around trying to take out the bandits and then take down uh, these bombers. That's going to be so cool. Uh, same here, we got B-25 bombers, and now these are those naval missions that I was pointing you guys to. Uh, destroyers, cruisers, obviously the story is going to be smaller, so just a few sites to take out. Cruisers going to be bigger, more sites to worry about. You see these are going to be listed down as naval, and that's going to tell you to use the, uh, the naval counters, the naval sites. Taking on a battleship, that's going to be an awesome mission. A lot of victory points, a lot of recon and intel that you can gain out of that. Uh, also, naval, it's a hard target. It's going to cause you more stress. A lot of sites to worry about. That's going to be crucial. Let's see. With two sites on the target and then two sites potentially for each uh, approach area, you could have upwards of 10 sites. Imagine 10 of those 40 mils or, or a mix of the 40 mil and the five inch and three inch guns all around you having to send your uh, fighters and bombers into it. That's going to be just crucial trying to get in and out. Oh, and it's even worse over here, three sites and two and then bandits to worry about on top of it. Those are going to be some hard missions to get your guys in and out. And remember, you got to keep track of their maintenance levels to make sure that they're, uh, they're not, uh, being torn up in between missions too badly so you can still keep flying these missions uh cargo ships troop ships sea uh, sea search bivouac harbor installation so you're bombing uh the harbors that the americans are trying to set up Ooh, taking out heavy bombers that's gonna be a fun one photo recon couple of photo recon all right so these are some of the cards uh the other one here is just the back side of these that i've already showed you it's nothing you guys haven't seen yet Again, all of this stuff is prototype. It is in the, the early stage, but it is coming to Kickstarter, I know, very soon. I will let you guys know any other updates that I do hear about it, interesting stuff. But I, honestly, I think this one's a no-brainer. DVG always puts out good stuff. Corsair Leader, like I said, is uh, one of my favorites when it comes to the Leader series. I love the Pacific Theater. So for me, Corsair Leader, is, it, it's right there i love it i love the aspect that when you're sending in your your uh, planes you're not just worrying about moving them across the the grid trying to get to the target you're actually having to worry about what maneuver you're going to perform with your plane and you try to out dogfight the the bandits and you're having to worry about the sights that are down on the ground firing up at you at the same time there's a lot of aspects to to be concerned with as you're doing that and you can even have a well, in Corsair Leader, you can have a, a campaign where you're playing like it's a aircraft carrier that you take through the, the entirety of the war. Really awesome. That's why I was uh, so fond of Corsair Leader, uh, Leader. And like I said, Corsair Leader did, I admit, start off a little rough. Had a few errata that had to be put into the game to, to fix a few things. But it's definitely flowing smooth now, and I think that's going to put them on a good path here for Zero Leader because they did iron out all the kinks and ready to just hit the ground running with it. So, yeah, if you're into Corsair Leader, you're into DVG games, I think Zero Leader is a no-brainer. I think it's going to be one to just jump right on to. Uh, it's, it's more the same goodness that you like just from the other side, seeing how the Japanese experienced it and some of the little quirks that they had. Uh, to deal with like the maintenance issues. Uh, if you guys have any questions about the game or anything you want to know about, feel free to put it down in the comments and I will try to get that answered for you guys. Anyway, that's going to be it for me. You guys take care. I will catch you in the next one.